Hello there. You're watching the Press Preview, a first look at what is on the front pages as they arrive. And in the next half hour, we'll see what's making the headlines with the editor of the Jewish Chronicle, Jake Wallace-Simons, and also the I columnist, Yasmin Alibi-Brown. So let's see what's on the front of some of those pages, starting with The Guardian, which says Ofsted has bowed to pressure and halted school inspections after the suicide of head teacher Ruth Perry when her school in Reading was downgraded. The Telegraph says there was a record number of excess deaths last year amid repeated strikes by workers and the NHS and the continued cost of the COVID pandemic. The Sun pictures 16-year-old Harry Pittman, the London boy, stabbed to death during the New Year celebrations last night. The Eye leads with news that attacks on merchant shipping by Houthi rebels from Yemen in the Red Sea are expected to drive up food prices here in Britain. The Mail reports that police are investigating the first case of rape in the metaverse after a child was attacked in a virtual reality video game. The Mirror has a poll which shows that two-thirds of people want a general election by the summer because the country is tired of Tory rule. The Express speaks to Rishi Sunak, who insists that his relentless action to drive down illegal migration and stop the small boats' crossings, the channel, is working. The Financial Times uses uh, international edition, says that millions of dollars worth of COVID-19 antiviral drugs made by Pfizer have gone to waste because rules on who can have them have left them past their expiry date. And maybe to coincide with the current World Championships, the star has a poll which reveals that darts players apparently make the best lovers, while table tennis players are the worst. <laughs> <laughs> and a reminder that by scanning the QR code you'll see on screen during the programme, you can check out the front pages of tomorrow's papers while you watch with us. Well, to take us through them, uh, we'll obviously get their reaction on their sporting prowess. Uh, the editor of the Jewish Chronicle, Jake Wallace-Simons, and the I columnist, Yasmin Alibi-Brown, here in the studio. Great to see you both. Well, let's uh, start straight away with the Financial Times and its international edition, which has this story about the Japanese earthquake triggering tsunami warnings. Uh, as we record this, seven people believed to have died. Um, but... Yasmin, to you in the, in the studio, first of all, I mean, given the scale of this, 7.6 magnitude, a similar earthquake to the one that was in, in Turkey not that long ago, astonishing that just seven people have lost their lives. I know, I know. But, you know, so a housing in Japan and so on is, is geared to, to this, these, these kinds of events which happen a lot. But, but I have read that if this carries on, there could be a, another big tsunami, which surely, you know, would be the next big disaster um, uh, because it be in the magnitude of 7.6 and yet only four it says four here um, and then yes and it's, it, it, it rose to seven in sort of the last hour but. yeah and there must be more I'm sure there will be uh, the number will go up but yes it's a, it's remarkable uh, and Jake we spoke I spoke to uh, uh, an earthquake uh, expert a, a little while ago and, and he was you know was explaining about how the two things that he thinks have kept the death rate low are the preparedness that they have in terms of the culture in Japan kids are taught about what happens when they when they feel an earthquake coming how to react in school but also the construction of the yeah. of their homes that there's a lot that the rest of the world could learn from this isn't there that's right. I mean, it, by comparison to Turkey, in Turkey, there was a lot of cowboy building going on, which led to buildings collapsing very easily. Whereas in Japan, they're much more rigorous with regard to building their, their accommodation so they won't collapse on people very easily. But the spectre, of course, that's hanging over this is the tsunami of 2011, which followed a nine point uh, on the Richter scale um, uh, earthquake rather than 7.6 this time. Uh, and in 2011, 18,000 people yeah. were killed. And the Fukushima reactor, of course, leaked, causing uh, a great radioactive disaster, uh, one of the biggest that we've seen uh, since the war. And that, uh, experts have said, is not going to happen this time. There's no risk of radioactive leakage. Uh, but, of course, Japan is one of the most seismically active countries in the world. It's located on what's called the Pacific Rim Ring of Fire, where lots of te te tectonic plates meet. And as a result, uh, it, it suffers from a lot of these sorts of natural phenomena. And thank God the Japanese have, have grown very good in, uh, in building properties that won't collapse very easily. 
Mm, indeed. Um, well, well, let's skip on to the Eye newspaper. Uh, and Yasmin, its front page does have a, a picture of the, the earthquakes in Japan and some of the, the impact of them, but its, its headline is about the Red Sea rebel attacks. And this has been g going on now, well, since uh, the October the 7th and, and, and since what happened uh, it, between Hamas and, and Israel. It's now appearing that it's going to start affecting food prices here in the UK. Do you think we're all going to suddenly start paying a little bit more attention to it? Yes, but I don't think that's the thing that most worries me. The thing that most worries me at the moment, that this new front, if you like, is already uh, uh, things going on uh, in the Lebanese, Lebanon border. There's, you know, the First World War was a kind of jigsaw that came together with very disparate pieces. Nobody expected these different conflicts and con conflagrations to come together. This is what I fear we are heading towards now, that we will end up with a kind of terrible World War III before we've realised how far this conflict is spreading. So I feel, although it's my newspaper and I love all the people who work there, I don't think food prices is what worries me at the moment. OK. Jake, um, do you have the same fear that, that this is escalating out of all control? I think that Yasmin is absolutely right to raise that fear that this could uh, become a far wider and broader global conflict. I mean, please God, it doesn't happen, but it could uh, in 2024. I mean, let's not forget that the Houthis really are being run, funded and managed by the Iranians. Uh, they are, have long had this policy of using proxy militia around the region to carry out their dirty work, which then allows them a certain level of plausible deniability when it comes to retaliation. And so far, the Americans and the Western coalition has not retaliated on Iranian soil or on Iranian assets, naval assets or anything else. And so the deterrent is quite weak and they're getting away with it, if you like. But Yasmin's right. You've got the Iranians, you've got the Russians, you've got the Chinese, who are the three main powers who are forming this kind of alliance against the West, as well as North Korea and other, other smaller but, groups as well. Uh, also, and there is a, a real... This will spiral out of control, of course. But, but I also don't see it as the West being blameless. I think Saudi Arabia has been the proxy for the West with its war in the Yemen, which has been relentless for how many years? So... I don't. I don't, I, I, I would, I, I don't I agree Saudi, in one sense Western, that this is the West versus Indian the versus Indian. the rest. It's people not thinking about the next phase, which always is unpredictable and unpredicted. And I think I'm, I'm just hoping that some wise people wise up and start to realise what could happen. We are, we are happen. definitely seeing a polarisation, aren't we? A polarisation of, of anti-Western forces, Russia, China and mainly Iran, against the America, America and well, Western Saudi allies. Well, Saudi Arabia that, isn't Western. Um, Saudi Arabia no, is, course, in my view, an a, evil a, empire. A broad, a broad, it really is. A, a broad yeah, but you can't just and talk about Iran. The only which... way to really uh, ensure that Iran draws its horns in Sorry, is to restore... Sorry, Jake, I'm going to say this. Not, OK, uh, let's, let, not, let's uh, hear what Jake's uh, saying, though, Yasmin. Sorry. Jake, we just didn't quite get that. Do you want to say it again? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the Iranians um, are... are they, they play this game whereby they push the boundaries again and again. We saw it with the nuclear deal. We've seen it with Hezbollah. We've seen it with Hamas. We've seen it with the Houthis in Yemen. Their game plan is that they try and push the boundaries and see what they can get away with in terms of mischief-making, meddling and destabilisation. We've seen it in Britain as well with a lot of assassination plots on British soil that, thank God, have been foiled so far. And the only way to prevent that from, from escalating is by uh, delivering some, some proper deterrence uh, in the region on Iranian soil. It's been known for no, quite some time. That I don't would be agree. The no. 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 Uh, I really don't agree with, with you. I don't agree with you. Jake, pause there. Yasmin, briefly come back before we move no, on. No, sorry. I'm sorry. You, you keep picking on Iran. I hate the Iranian regime. Absolutely hate it. I'm a Shia Muslim. I hate it. Yeah? But I also hate the Saudis. And the Saudis, because the West sucks up to Saudi Arabia, you don't mention the role Saudi Arabia has played, not Saudi just, not not just, not just in what's going on in Yemen and those areas, but here they've totally corrupted the Islam we used to know. So this is not just Iran, I, I, it's Iran uh, and Saudi yeah. Arabia. I think what it does show I is, is as, 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 the, as the, the front of the eye says, you know, there is the concern, one, about food prices, but two, that it is expanding out and yes. it's bringing in a whole load of other regional conflicts yeah. that, that perhaps people hadn't thought that much about or, or hadn't 
Oh, paid a lot of attention them, yeah. to for a while. We'll, we'll park that there, both of you, because I know you could talk about that all night, uh, and move on to politics a little closer to home, the front of the mirror. Um, the mirror says, we want an election. Two-thirds of the public say Sunak should call it by the summer at the very latest. Uh, Jake, do you think we will see an election spring, summer, or do you think it's going to be autumn? I mean, it could even be next year, but it, that seems a little unlikely. Well, frankly, I think that the, the more uh, the Mirror and the Mirror's readers call for an election, the less, less likely they'll, there is to be one anytime soon. And the reason for that is that people on the left want an election because they want to win it, and they know that Labour is very, very likely to win. They want that to happen sooner rather than later. But the more the Tories look at the same kind of polls, they're going to want to cling on for as long as possible to put as many kind of as many measures in place to ensure the longevity of certain Tory policies uh, into the next Labour government. And so I think that this is, you know, it, you know, look, Labour is almost certainly going to win the next election. The Tories are not polling very well. Labour is 14 points ahead, according to the Mirror. Two thirds of people want this election to happen uh, by the summer, at least according to the Mirror and, and its readers. And 62 percent of people think that life apparently has got worse since 2010, which doesn't reflect very well on the Tories at all. So I do think that the more people on the left want an election, the less the Tories are likely to give them one anytime soon. Uh, and Yasmin, is it, you know, do, you, do you think that, that it's Rishi Sunak's you know, case that he, he needs to keep going for as long as possible in the hope that yes, he's got longer to show what he can do in the economy as long as to recover? Trying to have secret doc, uh, uh, talks with um, Cummings shows his desperation. I don't think there'll be an early election. I think, uh, you know, from... Uh, uh, we've heard uh, Labour Party uh, frontbenchers saying it's going to be May, it's the biggest secret, the least well-kept well secret and so on. I don't think it'll happen till the autumn, for the reasons Jake has said. Uh, very briefly before we go, The Guardian uh, is front page. This is about the Ofsted bowing to pressure, halting inspections. Uh, they're going to be halted until assessors are properly trained. Now, they did announce this back in December, I think. Um, Yasmin, I mean... It, it, for parents, obviously nobody wants something like that that happened to Ruth Perry to happen again. It's just ghastly, isn't it? But parents also need a way of comparing schools and schools need a way of, 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 of knowing whether they're doing well or not. But, you know, we didn't have this always. This was Michael Gove's comp bringing competition into schools, basically, was the idea. And uh, before him, there was another minister, I can't remember who brought it in. Actually, we need to know the good schools and the bad schools, but not with one word... Hmm. judgments and then these these terrible league tables which tell you nothing it's this the school was nature, brilliant isn't it? actually yeah. the school was brilliant and this destruction of a head teacher because of a one word judgment it's wrong, it's wrong. right we're going to take a short break jake will come to you first next time uh, after the break we'll be looking at a story including this one on the front of the daily mail which reports that police are investigating the first case of virtual rape. This is in the metaverse. Welcome back. You're watching the press preview and joining us in the studio. We have the eye columnist, Yasmin Alibi-Brown. We're also joined virtually by the editor of the Jewish Chronicle, Jake Wallace-Simons. Uh, we're going to kick off this off with the Daily Mail and, and this extraordinary front page. This is the first police probe into what they're calling a virtual rape. A young girl attacked by several men. Now, this is in an online video game, Jake. So... Not a physical attack, but she was wearing a headset, obviously immersed in the game, and a massively traumatic experience for this child. This is the, the most the, the strangest story I've come across in quite some time. It was a child under the age of 16 who was apparently gang raped in the metaverse while wearing a headset uh, by a, a group of other users, I suppose. And it's being investigated by the police. Apparently, she suffered uh, some severe emotional trauma after being subjected to this. I mean, so many questions. First, I mean, you know, how is it possible to rape anybody in the metaverse? I don't know. I've never been in it. I've got no idea. Uh, you know, surely she could have taken the headset off. I mean, there's so many... I mean, who was doing it? I mean, there's so many questions about this. It's very, very disturbing indeed. Um, it did say that in, in the story that, the NS, according to the NSPCC, 15% of kids between the age of 5 to 10 have used the metaverse with a headset at least once. But only 6% use it daily. So it doesn't seem like it's a very widespread practice. Thank heavens. Uh, but this is really weird and bizarre and very disturbing indeed. It's really disturbing, isn't it, Yasmin? You know, I've got 
teenage boys, they, they do game a lot and they do wear headsets and you don't know exactly. what they're doing in that virtual world. They're sitting there at a, at a chair, but, you know, you don't know what's and, actually going on. And I can imagine on. getting so into it that you, it's more real than the real world and, and the trauma feels real. Of course, not physical rape, but I can, I can just imagine um, how you can get so psychologically destabilised when you've entered that world. And we don't have enough people who've done research or who are monitoring what, what children, this world children are entering. Um, but I am, like Jake, baffled by the story too. I mean, what are the police going to investigate? Who are they going to investigate? Virtual characters? And what is the crime? It's really complicated. I think it it's really, really complicated. It is. Um, uh, Jake, you, you wonder, do you think that the, the tech companies need to be doing more? I mean, you said, you know, how could you do this in, in, in the virtual world? But the kind of behaviours that people are able to carry out in these games, I mean, we've known for a long time games like Grand Theft Auto, for example, have, have quite violent scenes and have very high age ratings when you, when you try and buy these games. A lot of these games are 18s. Um, you know, I mean, do we, do we need to ask questions about whether or not they should actually be being produced? Yeah, I mean, it just seems incredible to me that a tech company could produce a, a, a an all-consuming game that you access with a headset in which it's possible yeah. for some... I mean, in which it's possible to have sex, let alone for somebody to have sex against their will without their consent. It just seems to me to be astonishing that they could have done that without anybody raising any flags either in the company mm. or in the regulators or at a federal level in America, in America, or governmental level, or EU level here. It, the whole thing just beggars belief. It's just astonishing to me. OK, uh, from gloomy story, let's move on to a jolly one. Uh, in front of The Guardian, in front of lots of pages, uh, is Luke Littler, uh, the 16-year-old, who's doing fantastically well. He's through to the semi-finals of the darts. I mean, he... You know, I don't know a lot about darts. Me neither. <laughs> you asked my admitted she doesn't as well, but you, you've got to sort of admire his chutzpah, haven't you? Yes, and it's great. You know, we had that very young girl uh, doing fantastically well at chess the other day, 8 year old. I love it when young people are not in this mad virtual world and are doing something that's real and wholesome. So well done. Well done. Uh, I mean, Jake, I mean, it's, it, do you think this is going to get a lot more younger people into the sport? I mean, perhaps a lot of people might think that darts or arras, as we used to call them, is perhaps a, more of an older generation's pastime. But um, might we see a resurgence amongst the young? I think definitely. I mean, darts does have that image, doesn't it? A, a pint in the hand, a beer belly, men grouped around the, around the board uh, in a pub. Uh, but this guy, Luke the, nu the, the Nuke Littler, aged just 16, uh, looks set possibly to scoop the £500,000 prize and become a world champion. And what's, what's, what can be more inspiring for young people than that? Yeah, well, fantastic. Best luck to him. We're all going to be paying a lot more attention to darts over the next few days than perhaps we might have done. Uh, Jake and Yasmin, thanks so much for taking us through your choices. We'll be hearing back from you in half an hour's time with a, another selection, so thank you both very much for that.